Right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we're recording. And after a long hiatus, which was not uneventful, because as you know, oh, let me set the timer here. We interviewed the great Daniel Tut about his book, Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family. So we're always hard at work. Right. You loyal viewers, great content. I'm joined today by a very special guest, more than a guest, the other half, the K, K boy. He puts the Sig and Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, successor to the greats of psychoanalysis, the man himself, Big Signorelli. Big Signorelli, the Areopagite. Pseudo Signorelli, the Areopagite. There are yep. some of those people out there, some pseudo Signorellis, <laughs> but they will soon be afraid <clears throat> with our analytic raid. <laughs> so many ants and scatter to the four corners of the internet. And so what are we what are we getting at today? Today we will be discussing a very sexy chapter of or lecture in seminar two. It is odd or even beyond intersubjectivity. This is a big one, or at least a prelude to a big one, possibly one of the most difficult to understand of the early seminar lectures when we take into account the exact logic which he continues to unfold in the next chapter of uh this notion he has of the combinatory so com combinatory combinatory yeah <clears throat> I, I would say combinatory i'm off a of combine yeah right now and they don't always land folks yeah the what we're doing here is we're going to be discussing odd or even what exists beyond intersubjectivity? So let's jump right into it. I was listening to the Why Theory episode um, on Seminar 1, and I thought it was interesting how McGowan and Angley bring up the fact that at this stage, Lacan is very much wrapped up in this notion of intersubjectivity and it being founded on this notion of a symbolic pact, which we at this stage would understand as a sort of master-slave dialectic. It's what he imports into his theory from Hegel. Right. But he wants to get beyond intersubjectivity, to get right. beyond the imaginary of this kind of rivalry, this uh, usurping or this threat of the usurping of one's imaginary stability. Right. In this case, this game of odds or evens is going to, though, in a sense, initially be predicated on something like a contract almost. Uh, almost. And then like social contract. Not thinking that. about it, thinking about it as we'll get into it, one thing that is mentioned is that the, the there of course there's intersubjectivity within this sort of game of odds and evens, or as you said in seminar one, the pact that brings about the master slave dialectic. And there's a symbolic structure to it, but then there's something that escapes that or goes beyond. The sort of symbolic, you know, notion in the Levi Straussian sense. I think we were we were talking about it offline, like uh, the sort of impossibilities, right, within that. Or we could think about it with the ultimate quote or 
quad as a, however you pronounce it but he, the, right here in the seminar he asked right here what is the subject right and maybe we could see that as the starting point of going beyond the uh you know intersubjectivity because the subject is going to be the one that speaks beyond the ego right of um you could say the subject of enunciation in when we get in seminar 11 right the subject is going to be that which exists if we can say exists in this case in a state of pure relation or relationality between signifiers the ego consciousness perception and the subject are throughout the course of this seminar sort of fanned out fanned apart we could say in a way that is uh very challenging at, at times to grasp but especially when we're operating with certain notions that we inherit from a psychological philosophical ego of the cartesian variety so what we're dealing with here now that we've reached this stage is so what is it what is right. it is the question that becomes a noun in a sense in this quote <clears throat> the idea is that and i think it's interesting how he begins with the connection with the dream of Irma's injection. Right. That listeners will recall we spoke about this idea of what Adrian Johnson calls the corporeal, corporeal. playing on corporeal, the corporeal. And in that dream, Freud is met with a terrifying vision of the inside the flesh that is not seen within irma and this is a kind of uncanny version of the real we have an early articulation of the real here and it wouldn't at first blush seemed to have anything to do whatsoever with this recreational mathematics that he's going to unfold here. But we always refer back to the, the threefold within the threefold of the registers. Yes. How they sort of in, become self-enveloping. And in this lecture, there's another kind of uncanniness that we're going to meet with in the form of um this what is it of the subject but in this case it's a subject that is very much caught in the spokes of this complex mathematical to use a maybe a, i don't know if i'm using this phrase correctly but lacan has this notion of uh, linguistry like a yeah play of language <laughs> that's why he says here which i think is very interesting he he, he starts this lecture talking about the wolfman's dream mm -hmm. where he sees these wolves that for some reason have fox tails and this dream is evocative of the first moment of the primal scene in which a child it witnesses something which uh, at the time they have no need of to symbolize but later becomes very difficult impossible to symbolize and becomes a traumatic imprinting on the child now what's interesting here is that this vision within the dream is this other beyond the ego yes and it's also the other that brings us to the question of what the subject is so right. he he ends this saying something very interesting here which i like about analysis analysis is the only science or art or a what is it that takes this question of what is it very seriously what exists beyond intersubjectivity what is this other and of course it can't be pinned down but neither is it some sort of mystical entity which um, 
governs all things and life forms and uh, is in itself substantial. It can't, it shouldn't be entified as he says, but it emerges in a very interesting tendency of the subject, as he puts it, which I like this because you wouldn't think that something so elusive and indefinable and, um, you know, what remains the subject of psychoanalysis itself would manifest itself in something uh, so silly as puns and plays on words. Right. And that these, in the end, as he puts it, plays on words, puns, witticisms, and uh, in the end, lead to the abolition of the human sciences. He says the last word of the witticism demonstrates the supreme mastery of the subject in relation to the signified itself, since it puts it to all kinds of use, since it plays with it essentially in order to annihilate it. I love that. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's my long preamble. Master, right. do you want to take over? Right. So, so one thing that you mentioned, which I want to uh, kind of carry off on, is the fact that not only do we recall, again, Irma's injection, but then we have uh, the Wolfman's dream. Now, as you said, he points on um, a key role or a key uh, point in which for both Freud and the Wolfman, there is a point in the dream in which we could say uh, there's an anxiety provoking uh, element to it because the with the gaze of the wolves and the sort of corporeal of Irma's throat, there's something in which the sort of subject cannot, I guess, take account for or has no sort of uh, symbolization to grasp, right? And that's what makes it kind of anxiety provoking. One thing I kind of want to bring up is up until now, we've uh, gone over the ego multiple times. And what has he said that the ego is, or the I is an other, right? And he says like a lower, uh, lowercase other. So we could see in these dreams uh, for Freud, for instance, we have many egos, as you said in the Irma's injection chapter, we have many combinations of egos in, in it uh, mirroring itself, misrecognizing itself. We have the ego of Freud in the dream. We have the sort of alter ego of Irma carrying on. Maybe we could say the guilt of Freud. Uh, we have uh, who is it? Otto who gives the injection. Um, and then uh, the other doctors that are assisting and yet when he starts to look down his throat, there's something in which uh, we could say the subject cannot obtain a combination because what is the ego in the mirror stage, but the subject misrecognizing itself as the ego, right? We could say that as the first sort of combinatory factor, which is a mediation that allows for the others, the other capital O's discourse to kind of take form in the unconscious, right? Since as, uh, we've talked about in Function and Field, the unconscious is the discourse of the capital O, other. Ooh, so I like I that. Found, yeah, I found that very interesting. And we can see these combinations take form. And what is the word in there but the trimethylamine that sort of, you know, governs the subject, I guess, in that dream? Right, because the trimethylamine is uh, the rock that cannot be surmounted at the end of the dream it's the word of the dream it's the word itself right, that's right. A really, but that's a really good point you make there if i understand it correctly there's something in the encounter with irma's throat where the ego cannot combine with it right the Is impossibility it, it, like yes a, the, the, if you think about it it's a beautiful kind of poetic image because it's like the flatness the smoothness even though it's intricate and gnarled but there's a, a flatness a smoothness to just a like pure flesh that is you, you slide right off it mm -hmm. in a sense it cannot be combined with and it's not so much the fact of flesh itself but that is this metaphor which can't be punctured so we look for these we look for these uh for leclerc it's Poor jelly. <laughs> yeah. Although maybe not though, because that's a condensation of many words, but it is yeah. a sort of like 
the the hard kernel of of signification but it's not but it is still signified in a sense that's what's interesting to me right it's right signified in something that can't be further mm -hmm. synthesized we could almost say mm -hmm. so and, yeah yeah Oh, I was going to say, I like how like at the end of like 177, he talks about, I have tried uh, to fashion before you the myth of consciousness without an ego. It's just a, a reflection in a mountain or lake, but the ego appears a part of the world of objects, right? Among many other objects in which it, in, like as a phenomenon, it relates to itself. And I was listening to the Tupanamba discussion um, on the history of the big other. And I like how he talks about the sort of objective phenomenology in which we're not talking about uh consciousness is consciousness of something and how objects appear to me in the phenomena via intuition sensibility etc but how other entities relate to other entities and so we could see the ego as an entity object maybe um and how it relates to others right but then there is this privilegedness to it that it takes on right but it's not a sort of harmonious relation there is this tension that he talks about between man you know within man in his instincts and you know the ego and so we get into this sort of internal dialectic you want to call it but i just find this kind of interesting you know that he he, he wants to re-emphasize about uh this sort of tension that is at the heart of like the human condition right and the ego can be lost it is lost at the climax of the dream mm -hmm. in a very meaningful way and analysis right is the only sort of technique that's right. been developed to leave that moment in suspension right and there is there is something that he always repeats and it's starting to make sense now because i know i've said it before and I, maybe it was a little hard to understand but how on the imaginary on its own we see how the image sort of fades away and there's this moment of anticipation right we got an anticipation in the imaginary sense and then we got sort of uh pressurized time as Derek hook calls it with uh logical time and the sort of symbolic order we could all we could relate this to the, these packs so even though there's this intersubjective aspect to the packs uh it keeps the ego moving in this anticipation without fading away from the object it relates to but as you were talking about this metaphor about the smooth flesh that even if you try to grip on it it fades away it's like there is no aspect of the pack or uh of that structuration right there to allow the ego to relate to or mirror on and so therefore there's the fading away and that's what is anxiety provoking in which we encounter maybe the real well let okay so let this is great i think we're on to something let's un, unpack this pack then yeah. uh and how the pack grounds the game exactly yes so, yeah. so let's first say what is this game of odd and even maybe you've played it I don't remember playing it as a kid. I don't know if kids play with marbles anymore. Probably can't compete with. You know, I used to play rock, paper, scissors, you know, hopscotch. The Xboxes and yeah. their hula hoops and their fax machines and all. <laughs> double new double technology. <laughs> but uh, you hold some marbles in your hand, clenched fist, your partner in the game guesses whether you have an odd or even number and mm -hmm. if they guess correctly they get a marble mm -hmm. and then continues in that fashion right and and that's funny on uh I, I think i mentioned before squid games they played this game in the one of the events is it a reference you think to this? Yeah, no, exactly. Because I there's multiple times where they show like references to Lacan, and one specifically is uh the the Lacan's theory of desire in uh the, oh right the, yeah the room yeah I really need to watch that <laughs> so out of the loop on uh, so many shows but so this is the game of odd and even and 
there's a lot here. He's going to explain how initially the success, the relative success of the players in the game might be based on what we would think of as some sort of crude psychologism <laughs> emphasis on the jism um <laughs> like a, a, a crude kind of psychologizing notion of and he's going to quote the character of dupont from the short story by poe the purloined letter the next lecture is going to be about the purloined letter in particular but this character who, well, we'll explain in greater depth uh, about the Purloined Letter story in our next episode, but he says that he is able to play this game. <laughs> it's also mentioned in the short story. He's successful at playing this game because he, what he does is ape the features, the expressions made by his opponent mirroring that opponent and in doing so believes that he's able to enter their specific frame of mind and understand what they're thinking. So there are stages to this kind of inter subjective dynamic in which depending on whether you think I can't unpack all of them because it gets quite complicated, but the, depending on whether you think, your opponent is intelligent or an idiot, you're going to be able to anticipate three right. steps ahead of if I if I do the opposite of what they think I'll do, if they're intelligent, they'll anticipate me doing the opposite of what they think I think they'll do. And then there are levels to it. This is purely intersubjective. Mm -hmm. And he says, what if, but what if you are playing against the machine and the machine isn't exactly clued into the symbolic pack. However, right. much at this stage with chat uh, GPT, is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these forms, all these different kind of AI technologies, maybe they would seem even more convincingly somehow invested in the game as a symbolic exchange of places. But the idea is that when you're playing the same game against the machine, there's no way for the machine to care about the outcome. So, but as we know from uh, playing chess against the computer, I don't know what this, who who's the greatest chess player right now in the world or whether a computer is holds the title right. but it's like when you're playing against the computer they could they could still win without this sort of psychologizing right and like not only that but just like any sort of game like look at like a you know like a street fighter game where you know you're playing against the computer and the computer has like so many like combinations of, of moves depending on what like difficulty you play i don't know if that could kind of be a comparison as well but you know, there's there's really no like symbolic pact in the sort of imaginary sense with with like something like that. You're not playing against another human. Right. Yeah. So in that sense, you're playing against the he doesn't bring the big other into it yet. I don't want to say that. Yeah. But it's as if you're playing against you could say maybe the symbolic order, but stripped away of these intersubjective factors, which would allow you to outwit right. your opponent. Um, and then he talks about these three periods. This is similar to logical time, I think. When you say it has something to do with uh, the essay, logical time, and he says himself, yeah, because he meant another 
look at the dialectic of the game of black and white discs yes. placed in the backs yes. of the characters. Right. Yes. In in which, again, we can use the term pact, but there are certain combinations of the black and white. And with this, you have three different prisoners and all they're told by the warden is that due to some circumstances that one of you could be let go and uh, you have to deduce which one of you has is the right subject uh, without speaking. You could just have to deduce on your own. And so like it's based upon the initial look and then they begin to deduce like A sees that B is certain that they're th- they're a certain uh, a combination because they look at C and C doesn't have the right combination, but then there's this retroactivity of taking account for A, right? And so that is how they find out who is the real subject by the sort of deduction, right? But each each one has a sophism to them, right? And so that's why it's like, He's trying to get out, like, no matter what these, like, arbitrary combinations, it's not by, like, chance, um, or we should say, like, at random, but at the end, there is a failure to this sort of threefold combination. Because the symbol emerges in right. the third moment. Yes. And the, the temp, third time, the symbol emerges dialectically. Yeah. Not only in your anticipation of how the other will think, but also how the other will anticipate your anticipation yeah. of them thinking. And that's where I think you get this concept of the big other and why it's virtual. Mm-hmm. Just as we'll witness as he elaborates on this combinatory, the big other, and I don't want to confuse it with the symbolic order necessarily, because I I know that the, McGowan says the big other is sort of what enforces the symbolic order. Right. The yes. symbolic order itself is a mishmash of different signifiers, but these signifiers in relation to one another take on a necessity in the way they are patterned. Right. And there's a necessity, there's a predictability to it. In a sense, once you have studied the game, or in this case, uh, Fink says that the the recreational mathematics that Lacan is introducing here is not just recreation. Yeah. But he believed that an analyst, by looking at these matrices, would benefit in that they would develop a kind of agility in yeah. their analysis in tracking the signifiers that the analyzan uses and looking for patterns in the unconscious right and the certain combinations that they could take which m- mimic or or resemble the sort of odds and evens in which we have the different sets of what he calls uh what are they mo- movements or 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 placements um within the coin toss right i think it's just that, like the outcomes yeah, right? yeah but yeah so and what, what's interesting is that I think Alenka Zupancic emphasizes this a lot is this is when analysis done correctly can be the most effective because in paying very close attention with an evenly suspended attention to the signifiers used by the analysan, a perfect signifier can be introduced at the right moment. And it has nothing to do with the actual signified Mm -hmm. there. It's just you just lob in this signifier at just the right moment. And it could make all the difference in terms of transforming the sort of circuit of that uh, analysis. 
which I think and, is really fascinating. And wouldn't that we could say like in the early in this early Lacan that could be resemblant to uh, the notion of full speech, right? In which the signifier has a sort of immediacy or like revelatory aspect within these. Maybe if it's a parapraxis where the signifier comes up, you know, without the signified. Yeah, that's what the full speech is, right? It's like it's most full when the patient says something that and they yeah. didn't expect to say. Yeah, because it's there's no mediation towards it, right? Because if it was mediated, it'd be you know I tended to say that you know as the as the, me trying to identify with with the ego, pretty much. Which, if you think about it, what we were just describing with whether it is the game of marbles or the three prisoners dilemma, the relationship between analyst and analysand can be like that with the mm -hmm. analysand trying to anticipate what's what's the analyst thinking about yes. me? Can I can I cut him off at the pass before he reaches this re like oh I'm gonna have the revelation about my state before they do in yeah a sense. absolutely especially if it and if the analyst only remains in that level then that's where we get like into you know different muddy waters that Lacan doesn't want to get into and that would be like counter transference and even think that is viable as a technique to where even the analyst tries to do the same thing. We could see this with, you know, uh, uh, keeping it in seminar one and a Freud trying to anticipate how the patient is feeling because she's feeling very anxious and uh, she's very angry. She has a very like unstable relationship with the mother. And so these sort of uh, agitations and gestures are being act out in analysis and she is trying to place herself in this position to an anticipate guess and interpret on that level to make her cope and and sort of build these defenses since Anna Freud is the I guess you could say the founder of ego psychology uh build more defenses on the ego with this sort of technique of uh, counter transference maybe it's not counter transference maybe she wouldn't use that term but i think lacan would kind of see it as such but to keep it on this point uh mirroring and and seeing what the others thinking you know trying to deduce what the others thinking by their movement and emotion now let's talk a little bit about the the pluses and minuses so yes, now we go yes. from marbles to pluses and minuses this sort of the, the closest we have to a binary signifier in Lacan although he says the binary signifier doesn't exist but what we have is presence absence absence yes. presence the alternation of presence and absence what does that make you think of well the discovery of the symbol itself beyond the prisoner's dilemma mm -hmm. beyond the game of odd and even we have the original game which is fort da mm -hmm. yes he's got the thing tied around the the string whatever it is he's throwing yeah. it over his crib pulling it back gone yeah. here right yeah. gone here gone here and he is trying yeah. to you know this child's trying to cope with the not just the absence of the mother, but also the return of the mother and how, and the confusion that that. Right. Hails. It, and, it, and it starts off with other toys too, that are, are being tossed and then like being retrieved, like things like a ball and, and, and other child's toy. And then it becomes more crafty with the real, um, the, the casting of the little silk reel thing and then bringing it back. And then he has words for it, you know, And this is kind of like, I would think of these pluses and minuses as a sort of here, gone. He says here, the notion of probability and chance presupposes the introduction of a symbol into the real 
this sounds like early Lacan. Right. And I wanted to think if like if if we're talking about early Lacan real with uh lowercase r is like reality as it is, you know, reality in and of itself. Not so much of like the real, which we think of like something not only that escapes civilization, but can only be uh the product of the symbolic order and that excess that can't be accounted for. Although I feel like there is some of that. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. Not. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But it, it isn't fully developed. Right. Um, it's not as explicit. You have to really pay attention. Now, we have these pluses and minuses, which you could th think of as, uh, well, I guess what the plus is even minus odd or. Yeah. It gets a little complicated. Right. So forgive us if we fall so, at any point, but right. It's like right here. And 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 then this one, these four different draws uh or corn to tosses are with the machine, right? And so the machine is winning, I want to say, with the pluses. And so he's the loser, the minus, and then uh, on the fourth draw, both pick even. So it's a draw right there. But then I think that's where the computer switches up, right? And so what he's trying to get at is, is there's a certain like probability of the computer switching up after a certain amount of wins or losses, right? Which is which means that it is not pure randomness, right? But the it's not. But nor is it the computer questioning, right? The moves exactly. It's that when you have a series of pluses and minuses, dice rolls, guesses at odds and evens. Mm -hmm a succession of these turns mm -hmm. will inevitably conform to a certain logic. And this logic has nothing to do with intention. It has nothing to do with guessing. And the computer is proof of that just mm -hmm. to show that there is an automaticity yeah. The symbolic order. So now we are on 84, right? And so right here is when we talk about he 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 brings it more down to earth with these sort of um it's not it's not random or like chance in the in the ordinary sense like it like an atheist would be like oh the universe happened by uh you know the big bang the big bang was just chance but like in this sort of symbolic order there uh in the symbolic order there's a a, a we could say necessary uh, necessary contingency right based upon first draw and what he says right here, I find interesting in the psychopathology of everyday life. Uh, he talks about the experiment, uh, uh, like he calls it the uh, known metaphor of the rabbit, which one is already advised to remember was previously put into the hat. Uh, Freud notices that a number drawn from the hat will quickly bring out things which will lead the subject to that moment when he slept with his little sister, even the year he filled his bachelorette because that morning he had masturbated. If we acknowledge with, with these experiences, we will be obliged to postulate the chance that the, that, that chance doesn't exist. And I find that interesting because like from just this, we get into now talking about memory, right? And he wants to talk about the difference between memory and remembering, right? Uh, 
and the way I took this is that in these certain moments in, in analysis that the combinations could bring about certain movements of the signifiers and reading Bruce Fink's clinical introduction to Freud, he uses uh, memory in conjunction with signif- uh, the signifiers, like the S1, S2, S3, and all that, with the whole um, schema that Freud had of memory. The What, what was it? The mnem- uh, mnemic sort of structure and how these combinations could create these experiences that this patient had of remembering as a kid, uh, you know, sleeping with a sister or uh, how just one sort of impulse uh, caused them to do this and that and the third, right? And how the unconscious, if it's structured like a language, right? And desire structure like a language seems to be moving towards these different combinations to bring out certain repetitions, certain uh, combinations. And here we have the difference between history and memory. Right. I took that to mean you have the history, the unconscious, sub, the history of the unconscious subject. Yes. Memory and rememoration. Right. right remembering which is the ordering of the history the ordering of the history as opposed to just a memory i guess or well what does he mean here you think by like commonplace memory well i think it would be like uh anything but uh, signifiers within the chain and it takes remembering to order that history because a memory on its own isn't anything without you kind of recalling it and trying to, you know, work through in a fantasy of like, Oh, like, yeah. I, the difference between I play baseball. I remember, uh, you know, when I was playing baseball and I lost the game that was supposed to be very important because it was against our rival team. And like, you know, then I couldn't play, you know, lead, uh, or I couldn't, I couldn't be like, you know, or like if it's football, I couldn't be the lead quarterback, you know, because I lost the game. And so this, you know, hurt my identity, yada, 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 like this whole kind of chain of remembering this and that. Yeah. That's how I I think of it, at least. The difference between one certain memory event and recalling it and ordering it to create a retroactivity of your identity or of your history of the subject. Because one thing that he mentions in here is that I think with not with, with the importance of remembering and memory is that there's also supposed to be an integration of it, right? We have at least the result of integration. Which is... Would you say it's similar to reconstruction? Yeah, I would say so. Because it's the grouping of the succession of symbolically defined events. As right. Know. It's like the grouping of these memories gives them an entirely different field of not meaning mm-hmm. so much because ultimately there's a nonsense to them Mm -hmm. but the grouping it it's the juxtaposition of different memories that results in a certain kind of syntax grammar even yes it's like a grammar particular to the analysis end right and right here You'll even say the retroactive effect of it, the netroglycite, as Freud as Freud calls it, the symbolic memory, right? How the memories in their ordering, just like the combinatory, bring with them a impossibility and possibility that is artificial. Artificial in the sense 
not impossibility and possibility in terms of what's scientifically possible, what's physically possible, but language itself, you can make up words. Yes. Nothing. And maybe over time they'll even be accepted. Mm -hmm. But when you learn a language, you have to learn what's done and what isn't. And in the process, you are learning a sense of impossibility and possibility. And then that, I don't want to say influences, but absolutely, no, more than influences, it's too weak a word. It structures your life. Right. But even things when when we talk about like these certain combinations, when we get into like, the witticisms and parapraxis, these things that kind of destroy, or maybe not destroy, but bring an impossibility of the, the combinations, right, in remembering, in the memory, because that's the whole point of analysis and free association is that, of course, the, the pact, right, which is the money, but you're paying in order to to, uh, to come into the, the room, lie on the couch and say whatever is on your mind and you can kind of get used to it. But again, certain words fail and you can't account for yourself when you don't ha- know how to describe a certain experience that you're remembering because you came upon something that you're kind of distraught by maybe it's like a a memory of like uh something traumatic in your childhood you know whether it's abuse or whatever that ordinary language and these combinations can't sort of fit even if you're like what you were mentioned about certain signifiers that come out that that come into different combinations but yet they stand out on its own for the first time in this sort of encounter in the fantasy right because that's what it is. You're fantasizing. You're not just, you know, talking about your life, but you're creating a sort of phantasmatic narrative for you to to work through, like, who you are retroactively. Right, let's take a um, five-minute break. Sure. Pick up at three. Yep. All right. Yep, yep. Word, word, word. I just realized it's uh, it's coin tosses, of course. I mean, there's the marble. Yeah, game. where he's talking about coins, because that's what he's talking about in um, the, uh, not he, but Bruce Fink is talking about in the commentary, the certain coin tosses and the mo- the moments of different pairs, right, of, you know, Getting even twice is is the one. Getting uh uh what is it? A minus plus or plus minus is a two. That's what makes the two. Well, yeah, it's not odds and even, so it's like heads and tails. So it's like yeah, what one is you have your well, well no, I'm sorry, you're right. I didn't mean to correct you there. It's like there's odd even and alternating, or what's he called? Yeah. Like yeah, the alternating, right? Which is, are you talking about the minus plus or the plus minus? Yeah, or he says there's even symmetrical and asymmetrical or... Yeah. There are three categories. I don't remember them in depth. This is from an essay in reading seminars one and two, the companion commentary to... Uh, the seminars, an essay by Bruce Fink called The Nature of Unconscious Thought, which is very illuminating. Highly recommend it. Yeah, it's really but good. Essentially, you can group these series of coin tosses. Plus being heads, minus being tails. And when they're grouped in threes, and there are three categories... Do you have the book with you? I yes, yes, I have it right here. Can you just tell me what the three categories are? 
it's like you have so, minus minus plus 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 minus is one then you get a two which is yeah so a plus plus is your one the plus minus or minus plus is your two and then you got a minus minus which is three and he says that you cannot get a minus uh, a three that uh proceeds after one right what this means is that if you line up all of these coin tosses pluses right. and minuses in a certain order and categorize them based on whether it's plus plus like heads heads tails heads and have them overlap in a sense this is where it gets even more complicated and then those overlapping groupings themselves become marked right with a greek symbol it gets complicated suffice it to say beyond our can of understanding but what emerges are these patterns and what happens is the series yes counts itself so for a two let's say to succeed a one there needs to be a three or something like that that's not exactly it but no no there, what, what he's saying is that if there is going to be a two it can happen after a, a one which you would get like a minus so you if you get a plus plus then the minus plus right would, would occur um yeah and the thing is is that in the what he shows is that in nine coin tosses we get uh a one pair right and then a two and then that could make a three afterwards right none of this is going to make sense unless you read the, <laughs> the essay but yeah. basically in this series of tosses a kind of counting happens where it's as if the symbolic chain itself of heads and tails grouped in this fashion counts itself, meaning there must yeah. be an even number of twos should there be yeah. uh, so right. many coin tosses. Yeah, And what this means is that this is the nature of retroactivity. Yes. The nature of retroactivity is finds a parallel in this mathematical experiment game, these this recreational mathematics, in that signification works in a similar fashion. We're always talking about retroactivity because the past existing in the future is what Lacan's all about. The future yes. exterior, meaning what will have been. This yes. is the time that analysis is able to generate into being, which isn't the kind of time we're used to, but it is a symbolic yeah. time. And yes. it is the time of the subject. Yes, exactly. And that is the time of the transference. That's the time of the transference. And it the, there's a pattern to it. Yes, it's a unique pattern. It's a pattern peculiar to the subject. And yes, and and to kind of give a little sort of feedback on this, when we look at seminar eleven, he talks about the sort of temporal pulsations of the unconscious coming through within speech, and so he talks about this too as sort of temporal moments in these combinations where, as you said, the subject comes up 
into analysis. And so we could see this happen. And it's up to the analyst to pay attention to this in the way that the signifier is always grouping itself and where there's like a failure of that. Because once it already happens, then it starts to disappear since these temporal sex successions or pulsations, as you'll say in seminar 11, are when the transference happen, right? Just because you're talking to an analyst doesn't mean you're having transference. Transference happens when there is an, we could say, an enigmatic desire, right? And what is desire if not desire of the other? And so when we see that, then we see the subject engaging with the capital O other and how it reveals the self because mm -hmm. what does the other have? Objet A. Objet Petit A. And that is where the analyst positions themselves for this to happen. It's not that they're always that, but in these cases, this is where we see this come about. Can we cast that in a different light or cast a different light on that by bringing it back to this intersubjective relation between well, analyst and, and Alizan and the game itself. It goes the coin tosses. It goes beyond the intersubjectivity in, in that sense of we get at the subject, right? This is something that's beyond the ego that's speaking. It's something else that's speaking in the quad. It, the way I think about it right here um, in page 185, he says, I think at the end, I think that this little apologue with its problematic character has introduced you to the following, that there is to be a subject who asks the question. All that is needed is the quad uh, upon which the interrogation bears. And it makes me think if this sort of question ends up being que voy, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I'm kind of seeing it, right? Because what is the desire, not the desire of the other? It's not lowercase other, it is of the big other, right? The other's jouissance, the other's uh, thing that escapes. You know, you could look at it within the fantasy, within the game, trying to anticipate, but it's only something that is an impossibility that goes beyond the sort of set combinations. And yet you play the game to see as if you can get it. Right. It sort of like curdles at the edges of the symbolic order in, in mapping out this series of, of matrices that are first threefold and then fourfold. Yes. He isn't just explaining how the logic of signification works or trying to present this incredible scheme uh, which can be applied grid-like onto all of reality or anything like that it's actually what escapes these patterns right and, that and i wonder matters but also makes the patterns in a sense possible Wouldn't right you say? yeah and it's like i wonder if that which escapes is the sort of vanishing mediator just to kind of get ahead of myself you know and, hmm. and pass that yeah you know well it did remind <laughs> me of in for they know not what they do same I was thinking bringing it to the, the final moment beyond the triad. Yes, it's the fourfold. Fourfold. The fourfold dialectic. A moment that isn't often registered among readers of Hegel <laughs> where the subject comes back in a sense. Yes. And that's what I was thinking of here there's a lot of the dialectic no yeah absolutely yeah. or the logic of the sign which is sort of homologous for the dialectic right as the fourfold and not thesis antithesis synthesis bros right mm -hmm. where this excess may be what the intersubjective is actually 
right initially because rooted in it's like planted in the the mud of this sort of excess and then we return to it again but it's the it's not the destination it's the journey (laughs) yeah (laughs) i don't know what i'm saying at this but no you're on to something because when we look at the dialectic right well what what is zizek because this does tie in right we're not getting too off topic what does zizek say about the sort of comparison of the logic of the sign the signifier with that of the one in hegel is that with the sign for lacan the signifier that there is this uh split of the double reflection double articulation of the signifier within the imaginary and the symbolic right the reflection back into itself, into itself right within the no matter the combination it has to reflect back into itself retroactive but that, with that which escapes in that moving backwards or moving towards the future Right, and it is a vanishing mediator, a vanishing horizon, in a sense. I keep wondering what the nature of this intersubjective pact is, and I don't think that we begin at the imaginary only to purely shed the, its skin, but that we do return to the imaginary. This is what. Brian always says is that everything is ultimately registered in the right register of the ego. I don't, I, I think you get past the imaginary, you dissolve the ego only to return to it. The idea is not to become egoless. You, because if the subject, if subject is only a pure relationality between signifiers, then it's only tr- through going through leapfrogging through these signifiers right this and chain, so- we get to what the subject is that's the whole point i think in this seminar when he's saying how leclerc entifies the subject on a good day or doesn't do that on a good day he keeps asking where is this subject what is this subject and then reduces it to a what is it to show that everything he is dismantling here He's not actually putting back together to reconstitute a world, if that makes any sense. No, yeah. And one thing I want, like, it's like, well, if we're talking about an, uh, the analytic session, then what starts the pact but the payment? But is that constituting it? Or is it, say, what's on your mind? Or is it the Analyzan thinking that this person has the knowledge to cure me, right? Well, it's interesting because the I was thinking about this earlier. Earlier, there is no free association, right? Free association ain't free. It's like <laughs> you gotta pay for it. But you gotta also pay the it's toll toll. <laughs> You gotta pay the, the control toll exactly. The Symbolic order, if it moves on its own, of its own volition, in this way, and self-registers, records its moves in this sense, then, um, damn, I was onto something, I just lost it. Maybe this is analytically charged right now, the fact (laughs) that I, I lost it, but then okay yeah free association isn't a pure random access memory kind of thing well, yeah, unrandom it, access memory it does act within the payment right you know that is the initial movement okay i'm i'm okay i'm i'm conflating too many things yeah the payment's definitely a part of it but also it's like this attempt to actually speak what's on your mind say anything mm-hmm. as you put it it this attempt is destined to fail but it's right. destined to fail in the sense that you still as an ego wish to cling to a signified of the right. words you produce and initially your free association 
wouldn't qualify as full speech necessarily. Right. It's because- when you actually begin to free associate through error, through slips, that true uh, that a true kind of free association emerges, but it's still a free association, which is along the lines of uh, symbolic logic. Right. Because to, to free associate by saying what whatever whatever is on your mind, say anything, isn't everything. That's why Lacan says, I always speak the truth or at least try to because words fail. You can't say everything all at once. You can only say anything, right? And and so when we have those slips of the tongue, those forgetting of names, in which what is being free is the sort of drive of who is trying to speak, right? in a non-mediated sense, but they're only in temporal moments, right? It's not like in the way that I'm talking to you right now. That's the difference. And to bring it back to the aspect of payment, it works, even though Freud did have his free clinics and there's that book about it. That's actually, I started reading, it's pretty interesting. Theoretically, payment should occur because, ironically, like counterintuitively, you are freed from the debt of some uh, another kind of symbolic exchange, which happens in friendship, because in friendship, you're always indebted to yes. a friend in one way or another. Yeah. If you pay your analyst, you don't incur debt. I, you could by not paying them, but it's a different kind of debt. It's not yes. a gift. Right. It's a transaction. Yes. And therefore, you don't have to question what the meaning of right money is in this sense. Because when you're with a friendship, you need to give gifts of some kind and they have to be new and different gifts each time in proportion supposed to right. be what you've received from your friend and so you and you can't do that in capitalism because there's nothing new that you could offer to yeah. someone <laughs> and and this is why lacan was so interested in not only strauss but also marcel mouse because of his notion of the gift economy in which that thrived to create peace and kinships but you can't do that and 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 a capitalist economy. Even somebody like Baudrillard talks about this, that there is no symbolic exchange on that level, right? This debt, which is that of, he talks about death, which I'm not sure how that works, but you get the point. But somehow that gets alleviated or eradicated within the payment of the analyst. There's actually a section on that in this commentary work I think Jacqueline Miller talks about the importance of payment and symbolic exchange in here. But also in this very lecture, he mentions it, I'm pretty sure, near the end, he says something about why we charge our analyzans. Yeah. I wish I could find exactly what he says. But no, that was pretty sick. Yeah. If I if I'm gonna pat ourselves on the back real quick. No, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. You gotta bring in symbolic exchange, man. Otherwise it leads to death. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is what all friendships are predicated on. Mm-hmm. The one's gonna kill the other. Right. And and just for the record, I mean Andrew could kill most people, but it's like it's it's, it's 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 usually you got to be wary of the, the ones that are always like, oh, don't pay for anything. I got you. If they're excessively like, oh, I'll pay for you. It's like, that's the ones you got to be worried about. <laughs> it's not even necessarily that that person's trying to manipulate you. Yeah. It's just that things get out of hand in this same in the same manner. This is the yeah. way the symbolic order works is that the chain begins to count itself. Mm-hmm. in all interactions in a sense yeah it's a sort of symbolic death than it really is like actual death now he alludes to 
what is or more than alludes to he's going to foreshadow the subject of subject the focal point of the next lecture which Mm -hmm. is going to be on the purloined letter you know and this letter is like a letter in the sense of a epistolary yeah letter something written but also you could think of it as a letter like from an alphabet or a signifier itself right the letter Boy, for thinking. lacan doesn't yeah it, has, it doesn't have meaning that's it it's what mm, predates in a sense the signifier in it's more Saucerian. right being and so and just just to ask like a, a off topic question with this this is how lacan is playing on the poor line letter because in the actual poor line letter the the letter has to do with something of the queen's reputation which could affect her right that's the interesting thing is that yeah. we don't know Who doesn't tell you yeah. what the contents of the letter. Oh, are. okay. Yeah. And that is absolutely essential to the story is the fact that we know it might redound poorly on the queen's reputation, but we don't know what it says. And nobody seems to know or question it which is something that lacan brings up in the next lecture is that it matters it's of it it matters crucially right i mean it's it's a matter of life or death and yet at the same time nobody brings up what exactly is written in the letter yeah we just know it's threatening and it's equally threatening to everyone involved in one way or another. Mm-hmm. The letter comes back in the same way. The signifier comes back to bite us in the ass when we least expect it. And to me, it sort of wipes away the uh, linearity of our experience which is what the ego secures for us if we could bring it back to the optical schema we have the the ego as an object Mm -hmm. in the world as you mentioned but as an imaginary object we can't quite locate it but we're sure it's there Mm -hmm. And a word or a letter or something which is seemingly innocent, non-threatening, can suddenly, in some sense, undermine this cohesion. Mm -hmm. That's what the letter is here. We might be repeating ourselves, but... No, no, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I like that he talks about, like in describing the letter is that everybody has to like play a part and not bring attention when the letter is being stolen. And he mentions how, when the cops investigate, they have to be cops. Let's say like, you know, actually find the thing. The point is that they don't find it because they do their job. <laughs> right. Like they're, they're, they're falling into the sort of symbolic, maybe not mandates, but like, the sort of symbolic efficacy of how these signs operate, right? Even though, like, what whatever the letter is, is right in place, like, that, What what is the letter if it's not in relation to what the subject, right, that is in, in place within these, these movements of signifiers? And exactly, and the, the cops following their own symbolic mandates to the letter. Right. Take part in a very choreographed performance of their duties. And it reminds me of 
the lecture we were talking about on the four discourses and yes. was talking about the study that was done on uh porn yes the uh the <laughs> porn actresses and how you could reduce their uh performances their their acting to four different kinds of attitudes during yeah. sex basically or four or five or something yeah there's like the one that's normally like like just like obviously gasping and then there's this one that's like huh oh, that's all you got <laughs> there's a kind of yeah there's a boredom there's being overwhelmed yeah <laughs> i forget the other ones exactly the degrading one the- i think or the bored one, the degrading one, the overwhelmed. I forget the last one. <laughs> it was so hilarious because he's talking about it as a sort of like, was it a French semiotician that was able to do that? And he's comparing <laughs> the four discourses to that. <laughs> right. And he's <laughs> so th- there's a predictability to it. It's very much within the symbolic order, even though you would think, well, sex is the activity that would allow us to escape the constraints of sociality. But it's like, no, that is a part of it. That is constituted by it. But everything down to the grunts a guy makes to the faces the girl makes, apparently there are other kinds of sex. Apparently it's not just guys and girls yeah. having sex. <laughs> but in the kind of porn that Zizek's talking about, it's very cis the it's very choreographed right and that just shows that this what is supposed to be liberatory right well in a sense is no less a uh structured but sort of but scene that's that, so if we look at the unconscious and the symbolic order as something that is out there right not something that is like this internalized inner world or cauldron then with sexuality being constituted right the libido and the subject that right here we are caught in the sort of others discourse in which then we are anticipated into what we think sex is in these certain combinations right in again polymorphous perversity or how i mentioned about like you know how using as as kids use things as extensions of their bodies like playing with barbies and making them dress up and play house and then do uh what adults would call like oh they don't know any better they're just like doing things like that like you know getting the barbies naked and the gi joe naked but it's like right there they're actually putting the jouissance of the body out there right and actually kind of constructing and constituting uh maybe it's gender love or whatever on the sort of mapping process and staging Staging, yes, staging performance exactly. So it's a staging of the performance, but that definitely initially always involves the other's enjoyment Mm -hmm. in a sense. So it's sex is going to be dependent on the well, an unconscious fantasy. But also, if you think about it, the relation between the conscious enacted fantasy and the unconscious fantasy. Right. And I think keeping enough of the unconscious at bay. Yeah. Again, sex can be spoiled out of nowhere Mm -hmm. by the introduction of an unexpected signifier. Right. Some kind. Maybe not a signifier, but something that punctures the fantasy right Probably. and i think and what, what then like that of what the kid does to then learning how it's you know sex is like an activity between two bodies can only be taken into account once the words i or me are used as signs to signify m- myself but who am i if not what i'm misrecognized by which is the fragmented image of the body and the barbie dolls Right, it seemed to have a much more. It, it, I was listening to Becker talking about the earlier lecture that we 
already read, but the envy envy of the blind man. Yes, right. Who has seeming mastery over the, his movements and has a, a competency that I guess the paralytic in this case. Right. Has. Yes. Yeah. So we always experience it as a an external phenomenon that we are aping, much like Dupont in this intersubjective relationship exactly. and anticipating the emergence of a signifier, which will be the one of, hey, you're doing it right. Good yeah. job. You you're you're good at sex. <laughs> if, you're, if you're good at sex, nothing else really matters, right? That's, right. You know, because as, without, as as Freud's patient said, if you know, life without sex would be not a life worth living, right? <laughs> His obsession, His friend, yeah, <laughs> it's like Muslim friend or something. Right? I think so. You know, he was like, uh, he was like Turkish or something like that. I don't know if he was actually Muslim, but I know he was Turkish. And then we got just the end. This they actually play. Yeah, the odds and, and odds and evens. And like, Manoni's like, I like to cheat. He's like, I'm a cheater. <laughs> Manoni got busted on cheaters. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's an episode where that guy shows up at about, a seminar. I forgot about that reality show. <laughs> yeah, cheaters was fire. <laughs> Don't How sleep on it? cheaters. Cheaters was really good. Can <laughs> Manoni? <laughs> That's why you don't hear much from Manoni. <laughs> that's a meme, right? That's a niche meme right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's as niche as it gets. That is as yeah, niche yeah, as it gets. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what he looks like, but <laughs> he's always, you know, trying to vouchsay Lacan. <laughs> Your attempt at eliminating intersubjectivity nonetheless seems to leave it untouched. Sounds like a Bond villain. I know. <laughs> um, he's always saying that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like no, he doesn't Lacan though he doesn't eliminate anything he introduces. That's that's what I think is important what I was trying to get at before with the imaginary and how Zizek talks about it. I don't know that he ever gets rid of anything truly. So when he brings up intersubjectivity and he says this about Freud in an early in an earlier chapters, Freud doesn't he Freud abandons certain ideas, but then it doesn't ever he doesn't build things up just to like strip away everything that right. built it up, all of the different elements in the sense that like they were just provisional. Like there's nothing that's like completely provisional. That's that, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And if anything that there is, it's like always a new understanding of maybe the, the primary and secondary processes, because when we, we get into beyond the pleasure principle, he's still talking about that, but it's not in the same way as he thought of like with, um, well, at least if we were reading him with Lacan um, in the way of like the scientific writings or even in the dream work of reg using regression for those like different processes for the fulfillment of the wish, right? because the, the the death drive is something where the wish can't be obtained right because if that was the case and you could obtain the wish in dreams why would you need to repeat the dream in different combinations yeah because the point is to build up to the failure waking up as a kind of failure yeah to achieve whatever is brought forth in the navel of the dream yeah in a sense it's like what mikey was oh. talking about in his latest essay about juissance and work like his it his, his definition of juissance in relation to the death drive is the death drive trying to almost like rid itself of Juissance, but also achieve the ultimate bliss in the process. It's like the attempt to enjoy fully we recognize as torturous mm -hmm. as the 
what enslaves us, our psyches in a sense. And yet the drive is also aimed at like, yeah, like we're trying to rid ourselves of that in death, but also to achieve the ultimate bliss. Right. In of life. what all of these failed attempts we're getting at simultaneously. So this is what's the all the contradiction at mm -hmm. at the core of our being. And the the dream itself is a nice little storybook that encapsulates that. It's it's the writ, as he says in the holy writ. The holy writ. <laughs> all right. I think that about does it. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a banger. <laughs> that, that was a yeah, that was good. 